In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for our She Says Amsterdam livecast event on shameless self-promotion. My name is Kerry Finch, and I'm the founding partner of communications company Future Factor, and we help our clients from our offices here in Amsterdam and also in Los Angeles and London. I'm also the proud founder of She Says Amsterdam. And we're part of, well, what must be now 30, 40 chapters of the She Says Global award-winning organization around the world. And the point of the organization is to support, champion, mentor, and help women in business. Why? What's the point? We just want to see more women at the top. It's as simple as that. So we've got a fantastic lineup today from uh, five speakers, both in the studio and joining us on Zoom. But I first First, I want to make sure that we understand how the live cast works. So we are here live from Pakhuis de Zweiche. We're on Facebook Live and we're also on Zoom. And please, we would love you, the audience, to join us on Zoom through asking questions and uh, logging into the chat and sending us in your questions that way. Please don't wait until the end. We've got a busy, busy hour ahead of us. We'd love you you to send us our questions for our five guests as soon as possible so we can start integrating them and including you in the discussion. So we're looking at shameless self-promotion. How can we even be talking about self-promotion, you might be thinking, at a time like this when we're in the middle of a pandemic? Some people can't bear the idea of self-promotion at the best of times. So we've got guests here who are going to discuss this and let's see if we can get some tips, advice and tricks from them on how to uh, work our way through a pandemic into a better future. So I'd love to welcome in the studio, we have have two guests here in Amsterdam. We're welcoming here Melissa Romero, apologies, uh, from Colombia, but now a native of Amsterdam for the last 10 years. A fantastic woman in business. You've worked with some of the biggest brands, uh, certainly in Europe and if not the world. And now you're a tech entrepreneur, or certainly on your way in that journey. So it's a massive step. And you're the co-founder of Lean In Amsterdam. So welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And my heck you are here from, um, I've forgotten your company's name. <laughs> it's going so smoothly, everybody. Um, from management events, yes. and you help run the training me, uh, the me events, basically. Mm -hmm. And you're head of skills and training and development at the, at the management events company. Yeah, that's great. Really great to have you here. And on Zoom, via the power of Zoom, I welcome three people beaming in from the UK as well as Switzerland. We have Viv Groskop, who's a radio and TV presenter, an author, and also a stand-up comedian. And Viv has written a couple of books. Uh, she's created a chart-topping podcast and also has interviewed some of the most important women in their field, from Hillary Clinton to my favourite Margaret Atwood, and also Nigella Lawson. That's quite the spread. Um, Vis Bratby, joining us from Women in Negotiation in Switzerland. And you're also the founder of Lean In Switzerland. So it's wonderful to have you join us. And Fiona Harold, uh, who was called the Queen Bee of Coaching by the Daily Mail. You're joining us from Somerset in the UK. And you're the author of Be Your Own Life Coach, which uh, became a global bestseller. So I'm really excited. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And let's cut to the chase. And please do remember to send in your questions. Uh, that is very, very important to us. We want you to, to join us. And let's, let's start with you, Viv. Let's turn to you and, and hear from you what your insights are about shameless self-promotion. 
Thank you, Kerry. Well, hiya Navant from London. I feel as if I'm uh, calling in on a Eurovision link. You it's are. very exciting. We'd love your, uh, we'd thank love your you results. Well to, to Dutch uh, listeners, thank you so much to everyone who's taken the time uh, to tune into this, whether you're watching now or on the catch up and wherever you're watching. I know how difficult it is for us to find time, even though we've got so much time on our hands at the moment, a lot of us. And what I wanted to kick off with was really a definition of what this idea of self-promotion might mean, especially now, and how we might be able to detach it from this idea of shame. I think lots of people understand, especially women, exactly what we mean when we talk about shameless self-promotion, because there's this idea that there's something sort of dirty about it, that you shouldn't be promoting yourself, you shouldn't be showing off, um, exactly as Kerry said, even at the best of times when times are in inverted commas normal. So how are you supposed to seize a moment? How are you supposed to show up and be your best self? How are you supposed to sell yourself or your product or your brand at a time when you need to be incredibly sensitive? And I wanted to introduce an idea straight off because I'm sure we want this to be a practical hour that we've got together that is really a, a tip as to how I've approached this. And it works in normal times and it works now. And the tip is to remember that you absolutely do not have to do this on your own. I think a lot of us, when we think about the idea of self-promotion and how we come across on social media, how we reach out to people, how we talk to people about what we do, we can do that in quite an introspective and tortured way. And we agonize over how to do this. And the way that I've freed myself up from this, because I have to promote so many things as a comedian and an author, I'm always promoting a show or a book or something. So I've had a good sort of 10 years really of getting used to this. It's to find other people to check in with that you're doing it right and that it works for you as a person because the level of what works for us all is going to be different for everybody. We're all going to have different ideas of what this looks like and what is acceptable, what is overstretching, what's too much, what's too little. So I have appointed uh, quite a while ago what I call an accountability buddy or a self-promotion monitor. And that person is my sister, Trudy Grosskop, who I hope uh, is watching this evening or force her to watch on Catch Up if she's not. And my sister, she's a teacher, so she has a very closed uh, social media presence. She doesn't have to do any self-promotion, um, but she's, you know, very good at bigging me up and uh, she's a supporter of mine, so I can trust her. Um, and it's really important to have that social media monitor or your self-promotion monitor as a trusted person, you know, not somebody who's going to feel jealous of what you're doing or try and encourage you to hide your light under a bushel or somebody who uh, is like quite shy and really, really hates social media and is very nervous. You need to find somebody who's in that middle zone. So my sister's job is to make sure she just checks in every now and again with how I'm coming across and what I'm doing. Her job is to make sure that I'm not coming across as a complete idiot. And she can do that as a lay person. You know, she's not in the industries that I work in, but she's like a regular kind of audience member. And she gives me freedom to kind of do whatever I want to do without having to think about it. Because if ever I miss misstep or overstep the mark or do too much, or even if I don't show up enough, then I know that she's got my back mm. and that I can check in with her every now and again and mm. say, do you think this looked okay? What about this? And it's so easy to find that person. You can even have multiple people to do it. You could have a friend, you could have a, an ex-work colleague, you can have somebody you work with now, and it just really lets you off the hook when you know that someone else has got your back. And it's so important, as I'm sure, you know, the whole reason that we're we're doing this and that people are tuning in and this has proven such a popular topic. We know that we really need women to show up. And from all the work that I've done with women around how to own the room, lift as you climb, my two books and the podcast, how to own the room, um, which is all about women discussing how they occupy space, how they own their confidence, how they really talk about what it is that they do and be really open and excited about it. it this is a great time for women to step up and just 
be honest about what you can bring to the table. You know, we need whatever you've got. And just because this is a sensitive moment and a difficult moment, it doesn't mean that you need to hide away. Uh, this is the time not to be shameless, but to be shame free, not to self promote, but to show up. This is the time to be of service. If you've got stuff that makes other people feel inspired, motivated, calmer, soothed, reassured, excited, hopeful. We really need those things now more than ever. So find yourself an accountability buddy or a social media or self-promotion monitor. You can't have my sister because she's taken. Find your own person. And remember, this isn't about promotion. It's about showing up. Viv, thank you so much. There's some really powerful, interesting words there. And we've got a flood of questions that have come in. Let me just quickly go to a couple. Nick uh, here in Amsterdam has, uh, has got a corker here. There's a lot of criticism and hate online, particularly directed at confident and successful women. How can we do a better job of aligning as men and women to push back against this? Thank you, Nick. That's such a great question. Well, the first thing to say is obviously haters going to hate, right? Yep. <laughs> There's very little we can do to affect people who want to express their negativity online. Yep. Let them be, you know, and I say that very much from the perspective of, of, of a performer who has received heckles in the room. You know, you have to deal with that as a comedian and yeah. neutralize it, be kind about it know where that person is coming from, that maybe they're having a difficult time and they needed to shout out or get very drunk and mess things up for everyone. That's not my problem. You know, it's my problem to deal with it, but it's not on me personally and I can't take it personally. So taking that spirit and using the same online of whenever I receive or I see anything like that, my first instinct is to ignore it and on some level to treat it with kindness that, yeah. you know, uh, the novelist Marianne um, Keyes talks about this a lot, that you have to imagine that that person is in a bad place and that yeah. they're acting out in some way. So to ignore those things in terms of what we can do as a society for men and for women, especially to deal with a lot of the, the abuse that women receive, I think talking about it and calling it out whenever we can in these kind of forums and, and, expressing the fact that we don't accept it or approve of it on any level. I think that's really important. But for us as individuals, my real advice is, you know, as somebody who's also received one star reviews, you know, for my books and, and my comedy shows, you know, other people are entitled to have an opinion. Yes, absolutely. And you have to learn how to roll with the punches and just let it go. Yeah, that's great advice there. Quickly, a couple of questions. One which you can probably answer very fast. JH uh, asks, how many times do you check in with your sister in a year? <laughs> in a year? Well, to be honest, since I set up this uh, protocol, which I probably set up a few years ago. Um, Did you never speak to her again? Yeah, it, well, no, it hardly, we obviously, we speak to each other like a few times a week anyway, but it hardly ever comes up because I've learned really how to manage this. Yeah. But I know that she's always there looking at it. And if I have moments where, like if I've got a new book out or a new show out, then those are moments where there would yes. be a lot of advertising and promotion around it. And so I'll say to her, you know, how is that looking? Is it okay? Is it a bit much? And most of the time she'll just laugh and say, Viv, this is your job. It's your job to promote stuff. Stop worrying about it. Yeah. But she's right. Yeah, that's great. Um, and super, super fast. Esther from London says, uh, as a graduating student in London, what's one tip you want to share that helps people stand out and promote themselves without shame apart from LinkedIn? <laughs> Get yourself a great website and... Right put something on it every single day, find something tiny and manageable that you can post every day. And that way you've, you've always got content that you can then put on social media. That's such a great idea. Such a good tip. Keep it simple, but keep it regular. Brilliant. Absolutely. Viv, thank you so much. Loving the blouse, by the way, it's a great color on the big screen. 
Marks and Spencers, well, Best British brand. We love it. We super love it. Okay, thank you, Viv. We'll come back to you later, hopefully. Melissa, let's turn to you in the studio. Um, and the same question, of course. We're talking about shameless self-promotion or shame-free self-promotion. We'd love to hear from you some ideas uh, and your thoughts, your experiences on this. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me for the invitation. I would like to, first of all, share something about the, the, the why. I think it is very important for us to understand why does it has to come to the point that it becomes shameful mm. to have to promote. And we all need to educate ourselves and also educate the people around it. I think to the point of, of Nick's question, for example, there is a lot of research done specifically by Stanford University, for example, more than 20 years of research. We have partnered with them in Lean In in order to bring about this 50 Ways to Fight Bias program. Mm. And it makes me think about the top four biases that, that comes to mind on the why. And number one is the likability bias. We are all the time, you know, fighting a bar that is too high. Either women are seen as likable or they are seen as competent. So it is rooted indeed in the old belief that women are motherly and communal, etc., uh, and that men are assertive. So in order to avoid the backlash, we avoid also the self-promotion. But guess what? If you are seen as too nice, then you're seen as not the right person for the job. So that would be the first bias that I think, okay, you know, check up on yourself. And I'm talking also to the women in the room because we are all biased, men and women. Women also have bias against other women. So that would be the first one that comes to mind. The second one has to do with performance bias. Just because our role models historically have been men, we tend to see men as better performers than women. And we try to put a bar way higher mm. on women. So that means that we need to work twice as much in order to get to the same kind of perception of, of performance. Now, as a result, you know, you need to accomplish more. You're the one that is, you know, working two shifts, et cetera, et cetera, to be seen as competent. That links to the attribution bias. Because we are, you know, tending to see men as really the better performing ones, we also attribute mistakes to women more you know, disproportionately and accomplishments to men. So a lot of times we think, okay, I'll work really, really hard and at the end I will you know, make it. But good work doesn't talk for itself. We really need to, you know, to be conscious about it. So the, what, what that does is that it undermines our self-confidence yeah. and then you start you know, developing the imposter syndromes and then you get your whole spiral down that is very common in women. And the last one, which is very, very important to know, is the affinity bias. We tend to gravitate around people that are like us. So if at the levels of decision and influence, we have homogeneous groups, women can become invis invisible, unseen, not regarded for cer certain jobs. So it is very important that we educate ourselves on these biases and that we check up on ourselves whenever we are having some judgments um, against women that we triple check, you know, is this my attribution bias or is this really the case? Um, that would be my first thought uh, specifically. Then, you know, I love that, that Viv shared a couple of really practic practical tips. So I would also like to do that. And I love that she said, you really don't need to do this on your own. Um, that would be, I guess, my main message here. Um, at Leaning, our main program is called Leaning Circles, and that's exactly it. A place where you can be, you know, unapologetically ambitious, where you can practice with your group of wing men and women uh, about shamelessly self-promoting yourself and actually getting tips and tricks. Um, it is, you know, a group that you can start on your own or you can join one. Actually, for the people here in the Netherlands, we have... Um, uh, what we call a circles factory coming up on the 28th of May. So people can go to Leaning NL. I'm going to shamelessly self-promote. Please uh, do. <laughs> go crazy. <laughs> LeaningNL.org on events. Uh, you can find it and then we can try to, you know, let you see what a Leaning Circle feels like and try to match you up with those kind of win women and wing men that can help you self-promote. Um, it is a self-space and it is really based on 
learning new things, but also committing at the end of every meeting to a micro action. And those people are gonna be holding you accountable. We know that women in circles, you know, are asking for more, are daring more, and are getting to higher- A bit um, like Viv's accountability buddy. Absolutely. So you can have a 10 group person that can be your rotating buddies and, and you kind of grow together towards it. And I would say the last thing I would like to, to leave you with, uh, there is a program that is called I Am Remarkable. It has been developed by Google, and that is also a program that um, we happen to facilitate. And it is beautiful. It's just about that. It's really about how to practice and get better at self-promoting yourself. It is really self-promoting is one of the things that are going to help you move forward. And I love this visual because it's really not bragging if but it's facts. This so. is actually Laura who is the co-founder of She Says. So I yeah, it. I love that she's bridging our two organizations. <laughs> I love it. Yes, absolutely. So indeed, I mean, we don't need to feel shame if you have really done that product launch that has been a success and is right now the market leader. It is facts. Yeah. It is not bragging. So own it. That yeah. will be my message. Thank you so much for that. There's some brilliant uh, ideas and, and particularly you're talking about bias. Mm. I would love to know um, personally, which bias have you either struggled with or, or had the most success in overcoming yourself? Because not everybody feels bias, of course, in the same way. Yeah, I think for both questions, struggling and succeed at, I think the likability bias is the more yeah. marked one, especially because I come from a different culture. I come from a Latin American culture. I live now in the Netherlands, which is a very bescheide society. So very tuned down, very humble, do my normal. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think I have kind of at the beginning learned to reteach myself to take it down a notch in order to belong or to make part of, right. of, of society um, over here. At the same time, you know, one of, I'm going to shamelessly say that, you know, I am great at bringing people together. So I think I have just used that taking down a notch in order to let people see me for who I am and then go crazy. Yeah. So I think that would be it. <laughs> We've got a question from uh, Eugene uh, from Berlin. Where do you draw the line between bringing value to others versus being self-serving? I'm not sure I understand fully the question. I think, but... that, I think the point is, um, how do you uh, do it without, with integrity, yeah. without it being all about me, me, me? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually, you know, it, it, how do you make it an exchange? Yeah. And how do you be authentic and true? I think yeah. that's the point. If that is the point, I think you need to be Apologies a really- Apologies if it isn't. I really, I would really advise that you're a really great listener. If it's not at words, is at the room, at the body language of the person, etc. Because then you can actually take the piece of your own value that is of value to that person, actually, and kind yeah. of translate the message into not mm. only, hey, look at me, I'm really shiny, but hey, I feel that you are in need of somebody to contribute into your homework. Actually, I am a teacher, so I can help you. Uh, I think that's the best way to put it. So helping the other solve a problem for them. And I think what you said uh, just previously about listening, mm. it, it will take you half the way in, in the first place. It's Definitely. about listening as well as hearing would be yes. my, my thinking. Um, what's the best piece of advice just to round up you've ever been given? Um, it's funny, I was just in a podcast last week and they asked me the same oh, question, really? <laughs> business-wise. Um, actually, it would be don't let anybody tell you what you cannot do. And in what situation have you experienced that potentially? Yeah, well, this was an advice that was given to me back in, uh, in university, right. actually, so long time ago. Uh, when I was, you know, feeling some self-insecurities, etc. Because I thought I was not good enough at a certain um, activity, but... Actually, you know, I just needed to have a little bit of confidence and dare to do the things and just... And take add. yourself over the, over the drempel, as they say exactly. in Dutch, over the bump. Yeah, just be, show, show up, just there. 
Brilliant. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, really great. I'm, I'm really fascinated to find out more about bias and the work that you folks have been doing, Lean In has been doing with bias. Uh, thank so you. thank you so much, Melissa. Thank That's you for great. Me, and we'll come back to you uh, online at the end. Yes. Let's now move over back to the world of Zoom and the squares uh, and over to Vis from Women in Negotiation. And Vis, thank you again for joining us. Um, we'd love to, to hear from you about what you see is shame-free or shameless self-promotion? Oh man, I've been loving the other ladies and your <laughs> contribution. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think I'd like to stack some ideas on top of those brilliant ideas um, and dig in a little bit deeper into the question, why do we feel that um, self-promotion is a shameful act. You know, why is this, why do we have that internal barrier basically? And I think it's interesting to understand that better or it's helpful to understand that better in order to kind of get over the hurdle. Let me explain that in a second. So first and foremost, why do we have these barriers internally? Why do we feel it's a shameful thing to speak up about our successes? Is because from the day we are born, we are raised differently um, as girls than we are, we were as boys, right? Boys are taught to compete, to show leadership. You know, I can run faster and I can do this better. And I, my dad has a bigger car. I don't know what they say. I, I don't hang out with boys very much, or I didn't when I was little. Um, you know, they're, they're really taught to assert themselves, um, you know, in many different ways. Whereas for girls, obviously, it's quite the opposite, right? We are taught to think about others first, to be communal. We are very uncomfortable with speaking up for ourselves, um, right? I, I see my daughter when, she, you know, she's only six, she has a play date. And when there is some kind of miscommunication, some kind of disagreement, right? They're playing family. Um, they'd rather stop the game, then actually continue and say, no, this is what I want to do. This is, you know, what I'm going to do. Very different situation for my brother who has three boys. As you can imagine, that is a constant kind of battle, it seems, where they are always telling them, you know, telling everyone what they're good at. And so I just like to add that to this conversation so that people understand, so that women understand, right? This discomfort that you're feeling internally with asserting yourself, with speaking up about yourself, right? Is not something, you know, yet another thing that you suck at. No, it is very understandable that you feel that discomfort. And it's also um, the answer to it. So these internal barriers, right, that we feel that as, um, Melissa just pointed out brilliantly, right, is also shown outside of us, right? They're external barriers because when we do show up and we speak up for ourselves, right, as women, we're not perceived quite in the same way as when the boys do it, obviously, right? So these we have these internal barriers and then there are these external barriers that we, you know, are very, very aware of. Um, and my advice for everyone watching would be to understand to really change your mindset around this idea of self-promotion as it being an act that's not about you but it's about the other it's about the person you are reaching out to the person that you are speaking to you're not promoting for yourself you're promoting for the other side and that i can only explain by saying how can people leverage your magic if they've got no idea that you've got it, right? They need to know what you are capable of doing in order to use that, basically. And so it, this reminded me of the Marian Williamson poem that I briefly looked up just five seconds ago, because I thought it might be wise to, um, or it, it might be fun to share. And I'm sure a lot of you know it, but I'm just going to repeat it here because the full depth of it, I think, quite sort of ties in nicely with this, where you understand it's not about you, right? So Marianne Williamson, um, her, you know, famous poem, Our Deepest Fear is like this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant and gorgeous and talented and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? 
your playing small does not serve the world. There is no enlightened, nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as children do. And it goes on and it gets better. But that's what I wanted to share because I think it's important to understand that when you are talking about your achievements, when you are talking about things that you are good at doing, right? You do that so that the other person could use potentially that magic, those qualities, right? For themselves. And if you are viewing this entire, yeah, this, this process, right? As one where you're serving others rather than serving yourself, I think it makes it easier. I think it takes down the barrier, right? Because it ties in with the exact thing that we've been taught to do as women, to think about others first, which you are doing this way. Right. So I wanted to share that. And then there's another part to it, which um, I thought about earlier, which is the fact that in sharing your magic, in sharing what you're good at, you're also inspiring others. And I think that's just such a powerful role, right, to Viv's point earlier. That's such a powerful role that we need to take I feel more now than ever, right? Um, I was reminded of the story of the the four um, minute mile that they run. When was it? In 1950 something, for the first time, right? They've been working and working for years and years and years trying to break the four minute. Um, uh, uh, mile and they weren't able to do it once it was done once two months later bam again it's the inspiration from seeing what is possible it's the inspiration from seeing what others are doing that makes all of us better ultimately um, this is why for example I continue to post on LinkedIn the successes of my clients right I, I teach women uh, career and salary negotiation skills and I often share anonymously their successes in you know on LinkedIn and other social media and I've, I've gotten some pushback on that right people asking well pff, you know well wonderful 75 percent percent salary increase but why you know why are you like so push about it it's not about me i don't care how people learn this skill i just want all women to know that it is possible right it is possible to get these results it's not one off this is happening consistently so i really feel that by sharing my client successes right that's not about me it's not even about my clients but it's showing women across the world that these results are possible for them as well and i'm hoping that they're taking a little bit of inspiration from that right that i'm lighting a little bit of fire in their heart so that they go and do the same thing Vis, thank you so much. That's really inspirational. I love the idea that um, there's magic inside us that is actually a gift. And we can see that yes. as a gift for somebody else. And that's very empowering. It's powerful and empowering. There's a question from Anonymous. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes that we can touch on. Um, the question is, I was told to be more assertive and to be more confident at work. What are the practical tips? Ah, practical advice. How do we do that? Um, oh my goodness. I mean, I think we've heard some really wonderful advice uh, just before us. I do believe as well very much in leveraging, you know, our sisters basically getting their help, right? So I'm a big fan. If we're talking internally, right, this particular person was asking about uh, how to do this at work, I would say team up with somebody else um, and make sure that in meetings, for example, you highlight their accomplishments and you make sure that they do the same for you right that it, it it's easier to do it for others again we're communal right we like to help others so it's easier to do for others than it is to do for ourselves so that can be um something that you could use um i um have a uh a, 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 What's the word I'm looking for? I have a task that I give to all of my clients, which is um, that I want them to keep a, what we call a brag book. Mm. Very controversial title. I want to brag um, I want them to get comfortable around the concept of bragging, but it, the, you know, the name of it obviously uh, doesn't uh, matter whatsoever. Uh, you could also call it your ta-da list, which I like rather than your to-do list. Anyway, um, regardless of its name, the concept is very simple. What you do is every day you write in this particular notebook all the things you kicked ass at, 
right? All the things you did well either that day or the day before, the compliments you received, etc. And the reason why I do this or I have them do this incredibly simplistic and yet life-changing thing is because we need to rewire our brains, right? So if somebody says you need to appear more confident, I'm less interested in appearing and I'm more interested in doing the work internally so that you don't appear more confident. You feel you are more confident. And once you really feel it inside, once you have this, you know, unshakable self-belief, it comes much more naturally to share that with others. Yeah. These some really powerful advice. We're getting uh, quite a lot of questions through. It's great to see everyone interacting in the chat. We'll come to these afterwards uh, when we've wrapped up and we go strictly to online. Um, so there's lots of questions that are coming in. But for now, Vis, thank you so much for your advice. I, I'm going to start my own Tada book. Good. Brilliant. Great. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Um, let's move on to Mai from Management Events. Mai, thank you so much for being here in the studio at an appropriate distance, I might add. Um, <laughs> again, you, you've, you, you train fellow, your fellow colleagues and in, in, in developing their own um, skills for management and skills for, for betterment in the, in, in the workplace. How does that play into, you know, what we're talking about today, shameless self-promotion? Yeah, well, to be honest with you, uh, first of all, let me say I'm, I'm just being very honored and excited to be here among like such inspirational women. Uh, women. Great points were already made. Uh, but to be honest with you, that was one of the points I really had to think of uh, right. when you first approached me. Like, what, on what kind of point could I contribute on this topic? And then when thinking about it, it's like promoting yourself is basically selling yeah. yourself. And when it comes And that's what you do for a job, right? Exactly. When it comes to sales, that's a very big passion of mine. Uh, but I also know that not everybody shares that passion. <laughs> And in fact, there's a lot of people that actually feel quite uh, uncomfortable with it. They feel that it's not natural. They feel that they have to push something onto somebody. And that can actually be a genuine struggle mm. for a lot of people. And um, that is a bit of a challenge because sales is such a vital po uh, part of all kinds of business, because no matter what role you're in, you are always trying to sell something. Uh, no matter if it's a product, is it, it's a service, or if it's yourself in this case, or your ideas. And um, that's basically when uh, when I was thinking um, that then uh, when I got to management events, um, I learned a little bit more about consultative sales because there are so many ways of selling. And that made so much sense to me because I come from a hospitality background where it's basically always about putting the guest in the center. And I noticed that a lot of the times when we're selling, we're so much talking about what we want to get across from our point of view. And we're not talking about the, the customer points of view at all, basically. And what I saw is that most of the time that leads a lot of the time to like short term wins and not long lasting relationships mm. there. And um, that's quite a pity, I, I would say. So when I was thinking about like um, for today, sharing a little bit more from this consultative sales approach to see if there are like certain things that you could apply also to self-promotion basically in there. Um, and when we're talking about consultative sales, um, sometimes it's also referred to as value-based selling or customer-centric selling. What it basically means is we put the customer in the center and it's all about instead of saying, this is what I have to offer, would you like to buy? It's more about first understanding what do they like? What are they mm -hmm. interested in? And then connecting that to the value that you have to offer. And uh, basically see it as like, uh, if you just start with like telling, this is everything that I have to offer, it's kind of like shooting with book shots. It's hoping that something would stick, something would interest them. Um, but what if you would ask a couple of questions first, understand a bit more of what they might be interested in or what they might need, then it might turn out that you actually don't have to mention all 10 things, but if you just highlight two or three points, you're able to like much faster go in depth and connect actually to that. And for me, that actually has proven to be quite successful, but also I found that to be a way to stay close to myself there. But then uh, I wanted to share some practical tips with you there as well, because how do you get to that point there. And um, for me, it starts with the first point of contact, no matter if that's email, phone, if it's uh, LinkedIn, um, there is no one size fits all. Yeah. Don't do mass approaches. I mean, I see it so many times. If you get called by a contact center, for example, they want to sell you something. 
you know straight away it's the standard pitch that they've done like a hundred times before. Or, I mean, nowadays I get a lot of messages via uh, email, via LinkedIn, and then I open them and I straight away kind of see that this is a copy paste. There's no specific reason why they this content. They spelt your name wrong. Exactly. Not even your name's that. not <laughs> even there. Dear madam. Exactly. Or sir. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> and then actually, um, I lose my interest straight away because I know 15 of my other colleagues have gotten exactly the same. So the first point of contact, I mean, we as people, we want to feel special. So if you want to approach somebody, personalize it. Really yeah. think first, like, what is the key reason why I want to contact that specific person and what is in it for them, basically there. That's the first point where you get to uh, have to get started then. And um, you have to do some research then before that. But then when you actually get to the conversation, um, for me, it also has a lot to do with mindset. And I think that is kind of like in line with what, uh, what Wies uh, also was, was talking about. It starts with really genuinely believing that you have a certain value to offer that the other person can benefit from. If you strongly believe that, then no matter what, you are able to bring that point across. Secondly, and this might sound a little bit contradictive, um, my mindset when I go into a sales conversation is my goal is never to sell. <gasps> and this might sound very, <laughs> very strange, <laughs> but what most of the time happens that at the moment when you are thinking about like uh, selling that end goal, the selling, you're so occupied with that that you forget to actually listen, to actually pay attention to what the other person is interested for. And you miss out on very important information to actually connect there. And um, that is something when I go into conversations, my mindset, and that has helped me a lot over the years, is that I always go into conversation thinking, I have something of value to offer. I believe I have something of value to offer, which you can benefit. Let's together find out if that's the case. So you make it more of something mutual there. And that actually, for me, that kind of like worked very well. Um, but then, then it's all about digging deeper, and understanding more. And um, it starts with asking questions. And what I've seen is that a lot of the time, a lot of people like asking questions is not the issue. People can ask questions, but the listening part, the not doing assumptions, the understanding part, that's the challenging part. Yeah. Because think about it. Um, we often say like, hey, how are you? And then the other person said, good. And we move on to the next question. We're not really interested in what they're having trying to say. So. Um, if I do these kind of things, I most of the time, when I'm not interested in what they're trying to say, most of the time what happens is that if we do this in a conversation, we ask good questions, but then when we get the answer, we either move on to the next question, or what we do is that we say, well, you know what? That is exactly what I offer. That's exactly what I can do for you. And we basically start to sell. We sell too soon. And the key thing with consultative sales is the understanding part first, like starting with that basically. And if we're then talking about like how to then dig deeper, I mean, I can talk endlessly about many different techniques in that, but one thing- You've got just over two minutes. I know, that's why I would pick <laughs> only one <laughs> there. But the one thing that I will actually uh, wanna share, if you have any kind of things that you wanna, uh, uh, if you find a core need or a business challenge, I ask three questions. First of all, what would it mean if you're able to achieve them? What happens if you don't? And what kind of plans or alternatives do you have in place to make sure that you're able to succeed in that? And imagine that if you have that and then you connect that to your needs, then you have like a perfect partnership to start with. So I can talk endlessly about this, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm excited I'm, when I'm talking. excited that you're excited. <laughs> I'm excited that you love sales. I, I, the, the horror of going in and not doing sales is, 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 is quite unknown to me. Uh, thank you so much, Mai. I know that you've got so much to give on this subject um, and we could talk forever. One really, really quick um, uh, question. Um, when you're building trust, um, it usually it takes, seems to take time, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Uh, is there a, a quicker way to, to create trust in a, in, which is, you know, not fake, but, but it's, mm -hmm you know, snappier is quicker. Yeah. Is there a technique? Well, uh, what I, I, I like to use is like the mirror of professionalism. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have heard about mirroring, you know, that when you use certain gestures, then you mirror and you put the other person at ease, etc. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> but uh, when I talk about the mirror of professionalism, it actually works the other way around. 
if you act in a certain professional manner, that meaning that if you do as you say, if you always, when I, for example, when I like book a meeting, I, for example, I, in my call, I already mentioned what we're going to be discussing in the meeting and what the goal is, and that I will be sending an Outlook agenda with the purpose again of the meeting with like the agenda in there and I will be following up on that. I will call on the exact minute that we have agreed to call, not a minute sooner, not a minute later. My customers know that as soon as I do something, I do as I say and I follow up on that. And that professionalism, if you treat people in that kind of professional manner, it's quite likely that they will treat you back in the same way as well. That's a, that's yeah. a great uh, um focus to keep and it's actually very simple you know well yeah. in principle it's yeah. very simple isn't it um, and also a really quick question for you what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given uh, oh there's um a lot pick one just one <laughs> just one i would say that for me it would be uh, that um trust yourself you know more than you can do actually and i think that most of the time we tear ourselves down yeah. that we kind of like, uh, I know that a lot of the times when I started my career, I was like 90% of the time at the table with like men who were like over 50, who had three, four times the amount of experience. And I felt that a lot of the times why I wasn't able to level at the beginning was because I felt that I had to prove myself, yeah. even though that they might not have thought yeah, yeah, yeah. that the feeling. And as soon as I got the, the confidence, then it also went much more easier and it wasn't the case anymore. Self-belief. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Mike, thank you so much. You. I, 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 and as you say, we, perhaps we can take it offline uh, or rather online <laughs> off air a bit later. And please do keep your questions coming. We've got lots and lots uh, uh, of more questions we'd love to hear from you. Um, Mike, thank you. You're welcome. Let's go back to the world of Zoom and Fiona in the UK. Fiona, thank you so much for joining us. Um, My pleasure. I'm thrilled to be here. And... Again, self-promotion from your perspective. You've done a lot of work as a coach. You've trained a huge number of, of individuals over the years. You know, you've been a successful author. We'd love to hear from you and your perspective on what it takes to self-promote authentically. Absolutely. I'm so delighted to be here. And um, I absolutely love everything that everybody's been saying. And I can sort of feel the support that's coming from everyone. And I think the thing I'm really getting from this evening, and I'm sure everyone else is, is how important it is to be genuine, mm. to be sincere mm. in everything that you do. So there's no shame. There's no notion of selling when you're connected to what you care about and what you want to help with and what you want to contribute to in a truly sincere way. So my dad was this self-improvement fanatic when I was growing up in Northern Ireland. So we'd go for drives in the countryside and listen to all these self-improvement chaps like Dale Carnegie and Norman Vincent Peale. But my dad was a salesman. Now he was the best salesman literally in the country. Now, admittedly it was Northern Ireland, so it was a very small country, but never mind, he was. So every year, so he was a door-to-door -door salesman, which meant he literally knocked on, knocked on doors and sold washing machines and vacuum cleaners. So the secret of his success is something that I carry with me today. And it is the best piece of advice I've ever been given. And he said, Fiona, don't try and sell anything unless you've sold it to yourself first. So on a Sunday, he would get, you know, this new vacuum cleaner out and he would demonstrate it in front of all the kids in the street, persuading himself, convincing himself that this was just the greatest invention. And this was going to make such a difference to people's lives, to housewives' lives at the time. So I took that piece of advice to heart when I got my first book contract, Be Your Own Life Coach. Now, I am good at getting in the newspaper. I'm good at persuading newspapers to feature me. And what I'd done was I'd got a lot of publicity in the newspapers, which had attracted publishers. And I got a five-figure book deal, which sounds fabulous until you sit down to start to write the book. And then you realize that you're way out of your comfort zone. <laughs> so I began to question what gave me the right to do the book. I seriously contemplated handing back the advance and canceling the whole thing if I hadn't already spent most of the advance. But here's what I realized I had to do. I had to actually sell myself to myself. So what you have to do probably constantly through life as you step forward and you take on a bigger challenge is you have to sell yourself 
to yourself, first of all. So the way that you do that is you look at the, te- the challenge, the thing that you want to do. So in my case, it was writing the book. And you come up with a list of facts, evidence that persuades you that you can do this, that you are the person, you are the perfect person to do this. It's a little bit like what we were talking about earlier. It's not bragging when it's facts. So you have to dig into yourself, dig into your life and come up with all the evidence. So I think the second thing that I would say is that it's so easy to promote and it's so easy to sell anything when you're connected to the service, when you're really connected to the value of it, and it's not about you, because then you're not pushing. And when you're pushing, and I certainly used to do this many years ago, I used to sell, um, and it was much harder when I was trying to persuade someone that they should buy my program or my course or my services. It's a lot harder when you're pushing because people back away. They resist, and it's a lot of tension. So connect purely to the service of what you're offering. And it opens up the space for people to come forward and actually ask for your help rather than you pushing it on them. So just recently, I set up something called the Coaching Club, which is a free coaching program. Um, And it was in response to this crisis. And we have just given, given, given. We've done free coaching every day, strategy and marketing and advice. But we've also had our busiest months financially in our history. And that was never our intention when we started out. So give, be of service, and it will come back. So I think that's it, really. I've probably said enough. (laughs) But thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. That's great, Fiona. Thank you so much. Uh, We've got a question from JH. I think we've heard from JH before. Uh, Fiona, you're so inspirational. What drives you to believe in your own facts? What is it that drives you? I think truly it was that conversation that I had with myself 22 years ago when I got the book deal and I had my huge, oh my gosh, what am I doing thing. And I, pers- I, I, I think I persuaded myself so well <laughs> that it stayed with me ever since. And I actually really mean that. I did such a good sell on myself. Because look, the biggest, the most important sale you'll ever make in your life is selling yourself yeah. to yourself. Yeah. Because if you're not sold on yourself, you're going to struggle. Yes to exude confidence and conviction. So you've got to sell yourself to yourself continuously. (laughs) Yeah, that's good to hear. Uh, There's a question from Jane. I've worked with multiple successful women who seem to actively choose not to be supportive towards other women in the workplace. Why do you think that is? Simple. Insecurity. Fear. When people feel safe and secure within themselves, they've got nothing to defend. They've got, they just don't have that insecurity. They're not protecting their space. So um, that's purely what it is. Nothing more than that. Just their own insecurity and their own defensiveness guarding their space. Um, You've you've been a coach for a a number of years now. You've, as you say, you've written, uh, you've written books on coaching. You, You must have seen the industry change and you must have, well, grow and then change. Um, what, what have been the major changes that you've actually, you've actually experienced and, and come across and helped women through over those years? Oh, the biggest change that I have seen and that I preach about and teach about and coach about is, and a lot of people won't want to hear what I'm about to say, you cannot be a general life coach offering confidence building and self-esteem building to everyone. I did that for about two years, three years max when I started. Um, I could do it because I had a very big profile. I was in the press a lot and also because life coaching was new. People were curious about it. Now the marketplace is saturated. You ca- Nobody makes money from life coaching. You have to offer something very specific and very tangible. You have to offer people results. You have to also show 
what you're bringing to the table, um, why you can offer that service. You have to be, off, be able to offer proof of what you're offering and you have to be able to offer a very tangible return on investment. So offering something that's vague and woolly and general will not work. And it's a bit of a tragedy because there are still coaching courses and colleges that are churning out life coaches every month. And it's pretty tragic because they're not going to make any money. That time has gone. Right. It was a window of opportunity and now the world has moved on. The, the, the business, the industry, as it were, has changed itself. And of course, women and their, their needs and requirements, I guess, have also changed. Thank you for that, Fiona. Really, thank you so much. There's uh, just a couple of minutes for a few general questions. Um, there's one here uh, which has come in anonymously for Mai. You talked about mutual agreements. Uh, does that work also with men, is the question. And I mean, I, th I believe that if we're talking about consultative sales and like getting onto mutual grounds, it doesn't matter like what you're selling or who, who, you're se who you're selling to, as long as the mindset is like, let's together find out if you can benefit there. I think that's the core. That's the main, that's yeah. the main thing. It doesn't matter who you're no. actually talking to. No. Um, and why, I mean, perhaps anybody uh, can answer this one, but why is it hard, particularly for women, to promote themselves? Maybe that's something for Vis or, or Viv? Do we have a, an answer to that? I wanted to pick up on what Vis said earlier. Okay. She, she brilliantly gave a praise of, of, you know, 4,000 years of patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, Over know, the course of seven minutes. Yeah, we, women are supposed to be a certain way. Men are supposed to be a certain way. And anybody who's ever had a child knows that however much you try to not have those biases, they exist in society. And, you know, the example that Reese gave of, of children playing, you know, it bears that out. But what I always think to myself, and I had to really learn this the hard way doing comedy because there's a lot of stereotypes in comedy about, oh, women aren't supposed to be funny and there aren't as many female comedians as there are men and everyone yeah. thinks that that's somehow evidence of something, even though intellectually we all know women who are really funny. We've all grown up with women who are really funny. Um, I, I, really learned, yeah, I really learned to think to myself, stereotypes may exist, some of them may be true. Sometimes, you know, stereotypes exist for a reason. But you as an individual are not a stereotype. And you don't have to behave like one. Yeah, that's and brilliant. That so freeing. Any more for any more? There's one question here from Petra. I am at the start of my career and struggle with leveling with more senior people. Do you have any tips for that? Is there anybody, perhaps Melissa, you'd like to jump in on that? Yeah, I can. Um, I have been in that situation, uh, obviously myself, at the beginning of my career. I think the, the main tip I can give Petra is to be authentic, be herself, but also what I was saying at the beginning, read the room, yeah. read the, the ways of the people. What is their preference in terms of communication? What is the things that really makes them tick? And then you can kind of match that demand, let's say, with what you have to offer and then simply try to get into um, that way. I have found also that building trust is very important. And you also do that very often whenever you are um, involving kind of a little bit more of a personal story in things or asking people obviously without crossing a border, but, you know, being interested also in their passions, their hobbies, yeah. their families. I don't know, that that can bring that connection so that people don't need, you don't need to feel like you need to level up. Like Mai was saying, like when she was very junior, as in, oh, these people are so much more senior than me, but that you just level up naturally as a human being because you yeah. also have a background and hobbies in a family and things yeah. like that. And the final question from Beatrice before we, uh, before we wrap up, and uh, I think this one's for Vis, and uh, you've got less than 60 seconds, Vis, so get ready. Oh, um, gosh, fine. How, to deal, uh, how do you deal with those women who are trying to overshadow you because of their insecurities? What are, what are your 60 second tips? Hug it out. 
Hug no, it out. I'm kidding. No, oh I'm kidding, God. guys. It is coronavirus um, time. No. Oh, yeah, exactly. No, distance, right? Virtual hug. Yeah, no, no. I'm out. kidding, guys. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the core of the answer really is um, love on them because they clearly need it, right? I really feel very strongly that way. When people are showing up that way, they're showing so much of themselves, much more than, you know, it, it says nothing about you, basically. And so when you realize that and make it, you know, less about you and more about the other, I think it's easier to kind of, it's not personal, right? It is business and it's them. Leave it with them. And, you know, really, you can just overwhelm them with love, kill them with kindness, right? I think is a is a strategy that's at least uh, stood me in very good stead over I've the years. I've used that many times in my life. So listen, let's go to a few questions that we've got. Um, let's have a look what's coming in at the moment. Uh, the typing is, is happening very slowly. Is there anything that uh, any of you would particularly like to talk about? What I, what I noted down were a few things. One was listening and hearing is super important. One was the buddy system that came up frequently. Uh, we're talking about facts and evidence that drives genuine self-belief. Um, there was, it's not me, it's not me, it's them in terms of the hate and, 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 and basically love them to death. Uh, my skills are my gift to you. So, you know, razzle dazzle them with the with the magic. And one that we didn't mention, but I learned from Viv, which is the pointless pen. Uh -huh. Was that a Viv trick, the pointless pen? My yes, pointless pen ran out of ink and I had to get another one from Melissa because I felt like <laughs> it was too pointless a pen to not actually and not actually work. So I had to have a working pointless pen. Is there anything that any of you would love to add right now? Otherwise, I think we can go to a couple of questions. Anything that's sprung to mind so far that you've learned from each other, perhaps, that you wanted to comment on? I would love to know from uh, people what they think is a specific uh, example that's really working well now during pandemic. We, we touched on this, but we didn't quite get to grips with it. And I've been thinking a lot about this because I've been looking at individuals and brands and seeing how they respond to this and how some people respond to it very elegantly and seem to continue their communications in a very graceful, seamless way that is very sensitive to the moment. And I've noticed that most of the people who are doing this really well and who are able to show up really responsibly, they're linking in their activities with charity. So they really are, you know, in the same way that Fiona has, you know, created this free resource, um, they're finding ways either to, you know, big corporations making donations explicitly to charities or um, other smaller organizations maybe giving free offerings. Um, I think that's an incredibly useful and important thing. But I'm also aware of the limits of that for lots of people because some people won't be in a position to do that. And I think there's quite an interesting tension there for people who would love to be able to show up and give. And, but on the other hand, they're worried about their future and they don't know what the limits of that are. Does anybody want to jump in? Mai, maybe you have some ideas? Yeah, well, I, well, I was thinking about it at, at the moment as well, because especially in sales yeah. now, nobody has budgets, budgets are frozen. Like this is definitely not the time to call to sell a lot of people kind of say. And what we have been doing a lot at our company is mentioning straight away, and what I've heard from my customers as well, is that they say like, also call in these times, but call not with the purpose to sell, but just to ask like, how are you doing? Like, how are you hanging in there? How's this affecting yes. your business? Yeah. And is there perhaps something that we can support you with? Like, are you, and is there anything that you're looking for at the moment? Not straight away, like the sales driven part with the purpose to sell, but just also like reaching out and doing that relationship being more building human. and being more, the human touch factor yeah. there. Yeah. This or Fiona, do you have an... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that there, are, you know, what I've been saying to coaches is, look, this is your time. Your people need you now more than ever. And if you do not step forward and are seen and are visible and are contributing, you're making yourself irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And it could be that once this is over, you're, you're, you're redundant. Because if you're not able to step forward now and contribute to this conversation and be of service to people in some way, 
really? Yeah. Afterwards, you may not have a business. Yeah. So I think it's critical that we step forward and in some way contribute. Otherwise, we're making ourselves irrelevant right now. I, uh, I've got one question which I'd love to pose to everybody. Uh, and then we've got a, a one or two case studies uh, that have been sent in, which are video case studies. And I'd love to open those up to the, to the group of you as well. But this question is from F.L. Fakiri. And uh, the question is, as a woman and a migrant, I feel almost all the time that I have to prove myself four times more. How would you advise me to deal with this stressful life? Who would like to, to jump in? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Melissa, as a Colombian. As a Colombian in Holland. Uh, yeah, I've been a woman my whole life and a migrant <laughs> half of my life. Right. Um, especially in the corporate world. So yes. I let's say I can relate. The one advice that I can give this person is to, I, I want to go back, you know, to the point of Fiona. You need to sell yourself to yourself. Because right now, the only person putting a filter on who you are is yourself. The only person putting a tag on I am a migrant and I am a woman is yourself. You are probably a very capable lady with a lot of talents and that's what you bring into the table and that should not be, um, you know, the, the, the fact that you come from a specific culture or country or whatever should not add to that. It is... Um, it is ourselves. I, I, I do believe so. And, and as V's also said, whenever you do feel it directly, because it, it will happen. I mean, my parents live in the U.S. I think it's better to be a Latino in Europe than in the U.S. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Um, and imagine. when I go there to visit, not in a you know professional way, but just to visit them as a family, I, I do feel the stare and I do feel it myself. But I also... You know, just breathe in and breathe out and say, yeah, I don't owe these people anything. And I am a, an accomplished professional. And, you know, not to compare myself with the people that are looking badly at me, but I'd say, you know, hug it out. Love to them and sad that they think that way. So just sell yourself to yourself and make sure you start with that brag book as soon as possible because yeah. it doesn't matter where you come from. I think that's a really good question. So thank you so much for sending okay. it in. That's really much appreciated. Yeah, uh, there's I a super that. quick one, which was actually specifically to me. And I wasn't going to read it out, but I will now. What is the best piece of advice I've ever been given? It's not the best piece of advice, but it's one that I remember, and it's very, very recent. And a friend of mine, she said, it's about when you hear that inner, inner negative voice. Talk to yourself like a naughty puppy. Leave it. Leave it. <laughs> so uh, I have to talk to myself like a naughty puppy, and I have to put that slipper down and stop chewing on it and go into the corner and think about what you've done, and then you come back a better person. So... Just sit yourself down and just say, leave it. When you're having those negative thoughts, it works a charm. It really works a charm. Okay, let's move on now to, uh, I think we've got time for one of our case studies, if not both of them. Let's take a look, I think, at, um, is it Irish? I think is how you pronounce her name. Uh, and it's about cold acquisition. Do we have the... Uh, the tape. Hi, my name is Iris. Uh, I recently started working as a video producer, as a freelancer, and uh, I'm trying to get in contact with secondary high schools, which is very difficult right now because they're all closed. And this is also the first time for me to do cold acquisition, so I would love to have some advice in how to handle this. A nice and uh, succinct. So I think we could go to who would like to tackle that first? I was going to say Vis, but maybe Mai. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, basically, I think that if we're if we're talking about like the cold acquisition part, a lot of people feel that that's kind of like challenging because they feel that they have to force something on yes. it. I think it starts all, and this is a little bit aligned with what the rest of the ladies also have been mentioning. It starts about really understanding your own value. Do you understand what you have to offer? Because as soon as you have a very clear understanding of that, then the next step is like, what do others need in order to be making a decision if they want to buy in on this? And if you think of it like that kind of way and really think then with that mindset of, I have something of value to offer to you. Let's together find out. I think that that kind of like takes away that kind of like dirty feeling that people were also talking about, about selling and having to push something. Yeah. 
Thank you. Any other comments? Who, who else would like to chime in on that one? V, I, I can, can see you breathing at least. That, if I'm allowed. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. So I totally agree with my that you have to, you know, have this core confidence, right, about whatever it is that you are selling. And um, I think the other really really essential point here is that you are or that you get wildly curious about what the other side really needs. Because again, coming back to my earlier point, it's not about you. It's about the other side, right? And so starting with them and really understanding what the needs are or of you know, whichever organization or whichever person you're speaking to, what their needs are, what their interests are, and starting with that to then assess is that what I do? Am I the right person to serve them? Am I the right person to help them? And if the answer to that is yes, that's wonderful. If the answer to that is no, then go and find somebody who can help them better with whatever issue that they're struggling with. They will remember you when their interests you know, align with what it is that you do offer at some point in the future. Yeah, please, Melissa. Yeah, I see that she's a video producer. I think she needs to also understand that in these times, particularly when everybody is working remotely, et cetera, and trying to, you know, be compassionate. I think there is a lot of content creation that needs to happen. And, you know, just put in her service out there and maybe something, you know, pro bono, like uh, what, you know, many companies are doing right now. I don't know if she's in the position to do that, but just, you know, giving a little teaser, and a little yeah. proof of what she she can do, putting it out there because, you know, not only schools are probably the 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 target group. Maybe she can even look at a bigger pie of potential targets. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, a question has come in, which is really relevant for right now because it's about being right in the center of the pandemic. Uh, the question is, as someone who has just started a new job remotely due to COVID-19, does uh, do the guests have any tips on how to make sure you show up in the right way to your new colleagues, getting across what you're capable of when you're all lacking that real life human interaction? I think that is a really tough tough one when people are starting new jobs and they haven't actually in person met their colleagues are there any tips and, and tricks that we can advise for that I, I would suggest something I mean I think Fiona. when you when you yeah I have a client who is in exactly this situation um, so hasn't physically met her colleagues so what she's done is she has initiated um, you know um, a social event where they get together at the end of the day on a Friday and they just get to hang out together like this and have a drink and get to know each other because that's what they would do on yeah. a Friday. They'd probably head down to the pub with a wine bar or something. So I think it's having that, that time where you just chill and it's not about work yeah. and you just get to know each other, yeah. Great, any other tips? Apart from drinking. Yeah, I think this is a real opportunity to use uh, a couple of ideas that just keep coming up in this conversation. Integrity, honesty, authenticity. This is a time that no one has ever lived through before. Yeah. This is a time that no one knows anything about, that no one is an expert in. No one has ever started a new job during a pandemic before when they can't physically meet their colleagues. It has never happened before in history. Um, I guess apart from like the 1918 Spanish flu, I suppose, would be the only time it's ever happened. So it's a great time to show up with real authenticity and say to your colleagues, um, guess what? I've never started a job in a pandemic before. Please tell me what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong. Tell me a bit about how you like to work. And we don't normally have an opportunity to have those kind of open conversations. I mean, it ties in um, with what we were saying earlier as well about this being a great moment um, to reach out to people and say, hey, how are you getting on? How are things with you? You know, people that you used to work with who you haven't thought of for ages and you don't necessarily have a reason to contact, why not check in with them? You know, this moment is, is a fantastic opportunity for connection. 
Thank you for that. And that's such a great way to, to, to wrap up, uh, talking about positive authenticity and, and vulnerability in a very, very strong and, and gracious way. We can all be vulnerable and we can all support each other. It sounds very wah, wah, wah. But actually, you know, what better time than in a pandemic, frankly? Uh, I want to thank Viv, Fiona, Vis, Mai and Melissa. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hearts all all round, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. Uh, I want to thank Pakash Svaicha, who is partnering with us on these live streams, these live casts for um, She Says Amsterdam. And I want to thank the She Says Amsterdam team, Kate, uh, Maxime, and Irene, and Dimfi at Pakhaus. I salute you. And thank you, everybody who sent in a question. Thank you, everybody that's watched. It's, it's a community event, and we want to keep the conversation going. Please go to social and join She Says Amsterdam and also Lean In, one of the Lean In uh, organisations as well in your town or in your country. Thank you. Over and out.